service at the cathedral, but you know, things are, we're working things out. So <laughs> just follow us on Instagram. Everything that, <laughs> everything that you need to know is there because it's always changing. So as of right now, 10.30 a.m., 6 p.m., and then worship nights also are happening. So um, those are our two services. We also have dinner parties that happen all over the city. We love dinner parties. Just tonight, we talked, uh, one of our teammates talked about how impactful their dinner party has been. And we've just seen God do some really awesome things through dinner parties. So we have dinner parties that happen all over the city. If you're interested in being a part of one, this is a great place to share a meal, share your story, and get connected into the life here at Cross Anchor. So you can do that um, at the Connect table. We can let you know about that. And Mr. Jacob, am I forgetting something? That was it, guys. I remembered it. Okay, great. Oh, wait. No, I didn't. Oh, I did. Okay, cool. Give it up for Emily, everybody. Can somebody get my good man Austin a chair? Because I think I'm going to have him. I think I'm going to have him hang with me. You know, you need a, a good team uh, around you to be able to do what God called you to do. Nobody in the Bible went at it on their own. At, on their own, like every person who was used by God in a significant way had a team around them. Um, I think of people like King David. God called him to be the king, and then he surrounded him with a bunch of dudes that were on his side. Uh, he gave him some, some great ladies in his life, too. Hello. Um, Jesus had his disciples, um, and he had men and women following him. Uh, and I'm not saying I'm Jesus and you're following me, but I'm just saying when God's doing something, he brings a team around. And uh, so thankful. That feels like it's kind of like the message of tonight. That is a short chair. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll let you figure that out. Uh, I'm excited for this message tonight. I feel like uh, God, oh, yeah, give it up for Seth Hobbs, everybody. Um, real quickly, uh, following up from the things my wife was saying, the conference, uh, I would get your tickets quick. Prices go up um, as time gets closer to the conference, and um, I would just go ahead and stake your spot. There's something about um, investing into something that you have skin in the game now. And it's not like, oh yeah, like that's cool, like I'll, maybe I'll go to that. It's like, no, I believe in this. And I wanna see this happen and I wanna be there when it happens. And so I would say get your tickets as soon as possible. Um, and you know, it, it's a big step of faith for us to do this conference, not just uh, numerically, because we're renting out the Masonic, which is a big venue. And come to find out, uh, they don't just give it to you for free. So, um, it's a big step of faith for us as a church. And if you feel so inclined to invest into the conference beyond, uh, you know, buying your ticket, you want to, like, invest into the conference, we would love to partner with you in that. Because it, it's, we're not, like, we're not even going to, like, break even on this thing. So uh, if you want to invest into that, then you can go to Cross and Anchor website and you can select conference. And we'd love to partner with you in that. And I've got a message on my heart. If you've got a Bible, you can turn it to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43. Now, when we, hey, how's it going? I can see you. You were like Zacchaeus earlier. Now you're more like, <laughs> not Goliath, but David. Uh, does it say anything about David's height in the Bible? I don't think so. I, Isaiah 43, uh, verses 16 through 20. Now, when we launched this church, who was here for the launch service last year? Okay. Like little, maybe like 30% of the room, or maybe some of you are shy, because uh, I know some of you were here and didn't raise your hand. God knows. God knows. Um, but Isaiah 43, we actually, I preached a message from this passage of Scripture to launch the church. And I felt compelled to return to it. Um, and I'm going to preach the same message again, so I don't have to work as hard. No, I'm just kidding. I, like, I'm actually preaching a different message. Don't worry. Don't judge me. I'm preaching a different message. I actually want to focus on one part of this verse that we talked about, but I want to just dive deep into it because I feel like it's a significant verse for where we're heading as a church and what God's done in this first year. And uh, let's start off by just reading this passage of scripture. In verse 16, it says, Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, which in case you don't know, let me finish this and I'll explain. Who brings forth chariot and horse, armor and army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. 
Now, what God's referring to here, in case you don't know or you're not familiar with this Bible story, is when the children of Israel were let out of Egypt, um, almost forcefully, because Pharaoh didn't want to let them go, right? Let my people go, Moses tells them. He doesn't listen, hardens his heart. Ten times God sends plagues, and eventually Pharaoh relents and says, I'm going to let you go. But then, after they've been let go, now they get faced with this gigantic body of water in front of them and Pharaoh and his army coming up on their six quick and Pharaoh had changed his mind and decided I can't let you go I wonder if somebody in here is in a bad relationship and you've tried to get out of it and then when you try to get out of it that person's like I'm not going to let you go you can get out of that you can get out of that God can help you but there's those people who they just want to put their grip on you and they want to keep you shackled to them in prison. And, and Israel's walking out of this thing and the Pharaoh's like, I'm not going to let you go. And Israel kind of feels trapped because now God did all these miracles, right? Let them out of Egypt. But now they're faced with this body of water in front of them and this guy who wants to kill him who's got the biggest army on earth behind him. Hello, that's a bad situation to be in. And it actually says, if you read the passage where this comes from, that they were scared. Uh, yeah, I'd be scared too. And then God tells them through Moses, he says, you don't have to worry. All you have to do is be still and watch the Lord fight for you. Be still and watch the Lord fight for you. And so Moses goes up with his magic stick, his, you know, this thing that he goes everywhere and does stuff with. It's not actually a magic stick. Isn't that a venue in Detroit? Yeah, he, go, he goes up with his rod. Sounds more intense. He goes up with his rod and he puts it in the water. And the, the Red Sea splits and there's a miracle that happens there. And not only does Israel walk through the Red Sea, but they walk across it on dry ground, which is actually two miracles in one. Because it's great to have a sea part, but you can't get across it if the water's all muddy at the bottom, right? So God dries up the water or dries up the ground, which is to say that if God parts the sea for you, he's going to dry the ground for you too so you can get across to the other side. He's not going to leave you stranded on one side of the Red Sea. He's going to make sure you get across. I remember somebody saying that verse before we launched this church because we had gotten to Detroit and we had seen the beginnings of this church and I was like, I had, you know, sometimes it's like, it's hard. Like sometimes things don't go like you expect them to go. But God parted the sea for us. Not only did he do that, but he also dried up the ground so that we could walk across. And so Israel gets to the other side. And then as Egypt follows them, you know the story. The Red Sea closed in on them, kills all of them. All of them dead. Greatest army on the face of the earth squashed by the water. How big is God? How powerful is God? Did you know that your enemies, God can crush them at your feet. And he can cause the water to close in over the people who are chasing you down. So God reminds them of this. And he's like, hey, remember that? And Israel's like, yeah. That's like the thing that we talk about all the time. That's how our nation was born. That's what we wrote songs about. That's what a gigantic portion of the Bible is about. And you see it all throughout the Old and New Testament. The Hebrews are always pointing back to this moment in time. Because this is when God freed them. This is when God made them a nation. This is when God delivered them. It was a big deal. But then God says something quite surprising immediately following this because he's bringing this back to their minds. And then he says, remember not the former things. When's the last time God told you to forget something good he had done for you in the past? Like we have to look back to the past to know how God's going to work in the future. We, we have to recall to mind the things he's done for us to deliver us so that the next time we get into a tough situation, we can call back to memory the last time that he did a miracle for us and we don't have to worry about the present situation that we're in. This was Israel's 1776, right? This was Israel's moment of independence and God's saying, remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. And then he goes on to say, behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And I preached a whole message last year about how God wants to do a new thing. And 
Sometimes new things come in packages that you don't expect them to arrive in. And so sometimes you refuse the shipment because you thought it was going to look like one thing and it comes as another. And so God tries to send us answers to our prayers and things he wants to do in our life. And we keep sending the shipment back to where it came from because we thought it was going to arrive in a different kind of box. And God's like, hey, don't look at the box. Just trust the person who sent it. And so we sometimes miss what God's doing because we're not looking for it. Even though he says, now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Like, you can't see it. I'm doing the new thing right now. I preached a whole message on that, so I'm not going to preach a message on that tonight. Even though you might think I just did. But he says, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. This is what I want to focus on tonight. Way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. Now see, a way in the wilderness was extremely symbolic for the people of Israel. Because they would have known what Isaiah meant by that. The, the wilderness for the children of Israel was not a good memory. After they got delivered from Pharaoh and from Egypt, they got to the edge of the promised land and they got denied entry. Because of their unbelief, God didn't let them enter in. And so for 40 years, the children of Israel did this in the wilderness. And God was faithful to them even in that. He let their clothes not get all ratty and run down. He provided them food. He gave them manna, which means what is it? People were like, what is it? And God's like, just call it that. Manna means what is it? And he did all sorts of things for them while they were in the wilderness, even though they had disobeyed him. But for Israelites, the wilderness meant being stuck. And I think God sent me here to tell you tonight that he's making a way for you in the wilderness. 2020 is not going to be a year where you wander around in circles anymore. 2020 is going to be a year where you get unstuck, where you actually arrive at the destination that God intended for you in the first place, and you quit hanging out back here on the edge of the promised land, but you actually walk into all that God has for you. You see, it's time to quit being stuck on the edge of the promised land. Because even though God did all this amazing stuff, Split the Red Sea, dry ground, plagues, you name it, all these amazing things. That wasn't enough to get them to the promised land. That wasn't enough. You see, God says, I'm going to do something even better than what I did in the past. I'm going to actually get you to where you're going. Isn't it disappointing when you get almost to where you're going? Like you work so hard, you plan so hard, you try so much. And then all of a sudden, at the very end, for one reason or another, you just don't quite make it. My wife and I have experienced that. It's not fun. But God doesn't want you to stay stuck. He actually wants you to get into the promised land. So God's almost like, even though all those things were amazing, it's almost like a reminder of Israel's failure. It's like, remember all that stuff? Yeah, that was amazing, but then you kind of screwed it up. And God's like, but don't remember that anymore. Doesn't that change the way you look at this verse? Instead of God being like, quit, quit you know, all the great stuff in the past, don't think about it. It's almost like God saying, hey, remember that, fa that failure you made 20 years ago, two years ago, last week? I don't want you to remember that anymore. Forget the former things. Forget the mess up in the past. For forget the left turn when you should have made a right. Forget the wrong things that you know you've done. God's going to make a way in the wilderness for you. And he's going to make rivers in the desert. You see, God can bring life where there is no life. God can bring hydration where it's dry. God can bring water into a desert. And I've called tonight's message River Wild. River Wild. Because God wants to bring a river wild up in your life. He's going to bring a river wild, y'all. God's not done with you yet. You wouldn't be here tonight if God were done with you. You wouldn't have breath in your lungs if God were done with you. I don't know much about deserts. I used to live in New Mexico, which doesn't really qualify me at all to know a lot about deserts, but I don't, I don't you know, I'm not a desertologist. I didn't go to school for desertology. The closest thing for me knowing about deserts is I get coffee at Desert Oasis. 
Somebody's like, that's right, amen. That's where I get my coffee. It's funny, that was the first place Emily and I, second place, we got coffee in Detroit, but ran into a guy there named Drew Borowski. And overheard him talking with some people at the counter about Jesus and the Bible. And then asked him afterwards, because we were thinking about moving here, but not sure. And we're like, what's the church scene like? You think we should move here? And he was the first person to say, you guys need to come here. So that's got a special place in my heart. But I don't know much about deserts other than this, that deserts and rivers don't really go together. Deserts are dry. Rivers are wet. That's kind of what I know about deserts. You ever see two things that just don't belong together? Like a, a, a tropical beach in the middle of Antarctica. It doesn't really work, right? Like actual nice, paved, well-kept roads in Detroit. <laughs> or maybe the Lions in the Super Bowl. No, no. <laughs> I'm not speaking death, I'm speaking life. <laughs> but just two things that don't go together, rivers and deserts are two of those things. And what God's saying when he says, I'm going to bring rivers into the deserts, the desert is he's saying, I'm going to bring life where there was dryness. I I I'm going to bring something that's going to change the entire ecosystem. Because where a river goes, life follows. Have you noticed this? When there's a river, animals start to come. When there's a river, there's grass and there's plants and there's vegetation. When there's a river, literal cities build themselves around rivers. Look at some of the major cities in the world today. A vast majority of them are built around a river for several reasons. But rivers bring life wherever they go. And God wants to take the desert spiritually that we're in. And he wants to revive it with his Holy Spirit. You see, the rivers of water that God's talking about, Jesus kind of puts the pieces together in John chapter 7. You've probably heard this verse before, but he says this. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. You see, God wants to make you an oasis. God wants to not just have you having a trickle or having a faucet's worth or having like we've got this fridge at our house where we push the thing in and the water comes out ever so slowly. God doesn't want you to have a little trickle of refrigerator water coming out of you. He wants to have torrents of river water, living water gushing and pouring out of you like a fire hydrant spraying everything all around. That's the dream. That's the goal that God has for you. And if you feel like your best days are behind you, I got news for you. In Christ, your best days can be ahead of you. And God can bring life where there was no life. I, I think about times in my own life where I've thought things were dead. I thought they were dormant. I thought I was done for. And I've seen just God show up and change the whole ecosystem in my life. Times where I thought, I'm done being a pastor. I'm done in ministry. And God's like, hey, I called you, right? So I get to decide when you're done. You see, God loves to do things that we don't expect him to do at times when we least expect him to do it. Maybe some of you are like, oh, my best days are behind me. God's done with me. Hey, check it out. You don't get to write your own story. God does. And as long as God's got the pen, there's any possible future for you. Because God can bring rivers in the desert. He can dry up the desert and make it drip with abundance. God can do something miraculous in your life. So I believe God wants rivers of living water to flow out of us. But he doesn't just want the rivers of living water to satisfy us, although he does want that. He wants for us to be connected to the source. He's the source. And the reason that living water flows out of us is because all of a sudden it's like plumbing. 
When you have a clog in the tube or maybe there's a piece that's missing, the water doesn't get to where it needs to go. When we come into a relationship with Jesus, we get connected to the source. We get connected to where the water comes from. We get connected to the river of living water. And so there's a limitless supply of water that can quench your every spiritual thirst. Every desire you have to be satisfied, God can fill it up with his rivers of living water and you never have to thirst again. You never have to go looking for satisfaction and fulfillment in another toxic relationship. You never have to go to another party and do more stuff to think you're gonna find the pleasure that's gonna satisfy you. You can go to Christ Jesus once and for all and he will fill the deepest needs in your soul and nothing on earth will except for him but he'll do it and he'll do it over and above you'll be filled with peace because he's the source of peace you'll be filled with joy because he's the source of joy be filled with grace because he's the source of grace you'll be filled with him because wherever he goes everything goes with him that he is when I was a kid, I used to go to church, and we'd always sing this song. I got a river of life flowing out of me. Makes the lame to walk and the blind to see. Opens prison doors, sets those captives free. I got a river of life flowing out of me. Spring up, oh well. Come on. Jesus wants a river of living water to flow out of you. And even if you find yourself in a desert, he wants to fill you up so much that you rise above it. But here's the thing that I want to tell us tonight, is that God doesn't just want the living water to fill you up. He wants it to flow through you to people who are thirsty. Guys, we live in a city full of thirsty people. When you look around Detroit, don't you see people who need to understand what it's like to actually be connected to God? Not just know about him, but actually know him. Not just know the Bible stories, but know the one who wrote the Bible stories. We live in a spiritually dry place. And I got news for you tonight. God wants to bring a river of living water into our city. And wherever that water goes, life is going to follow. God wants to bring a river of living water into the middle of Detroit that changes everything around it. The entire landscape of a desert will change if a river starts flowing through it. it you might think a certain person's situation is hopeless, but God's put you in their life so that they can see what it's like to be connected to the river of living water. And God wants that water to flow through you and end up touching them so that everything you touch turns green. God's called us, the church, to be his river of living water in Detroit. And if we'll let him flow through us, there's no limit to what he can do through us. I wanted to illustrate this, so I got a Chia pet. This is Bob Ross. Now, Bob Ross is dry. Bob Ross is a desert. Bob Ross has no living water flowing to him. And so as a result, Bob Ross's head looks a little bit like mine. <laughs> Bob Ross needs to be connected to the source. And once he gets connected to the source, or once God put someone in his life who is connected to the source, he's gonna experience that living water and everything that that person touches is gonna turn green. Bob Ross has met the fountain of living water and it's flowed into him. And now Bob Ross looks like he might be doing some things, smoking some things he's not supposed to. But he's got a river of living water that's been flown, flown, that's flowed to him. I know that God wants to use us 
to bring his living water to people. People. If I can go back to an old school illustration, we're called to be Culligan men. You know those big jugs of water that they drive around with their trucks and they put it in offices and stuff so you can have water at the little water fountain at your job? That's what God's called us to be, water distributors. We're called to take water to where there is none because we're called to take down things that have erected themselves up against God and we're called to build things up that God wants to build up. So I believe that once we get connected to the source, we're gonna see God do incredible things that impact our city and not just even spiritually, physically. Like if, if God's living water is flowing out of us, I think that crime should go down. If God's living water is, is, is flowing through us, I think we should see rates of poverty decreasing. If God's living water is flowing out of us, I think we should see education and reading levels rising. If God's living water is flowing out of us, I believe that we should see human trafficking be done for forever. I believe if God's river living water is flowing out of us, it should change the entire ecosystem around us, not just spiritually speaking, but into every sphere of life, that where the church goes, it's like Jesus is going there, and wherever Jesus goes, everything around him changes. God wants us to be the source of hope in this city, the source of life and the source of peace. I know a pastor who says, I want people to say about our church, like, I might not agree with them, but I can't imagine this city without them. Can you imagine if we would do that as a church? I want to close with this verse from Revelation. And I'll invite the band to come back up. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. This is the very last chapter of the Bible. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no lamp of lamp or sun, for the light of the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. This is our destiny as children of our Heavenly Father. And, and this, is, this is a picture of heaven, yes. But let's go back to the beginning, Jacob. It says that there was a river of the water of life flowing from the throne of God. Do you know that when God takes residence in the throne of your heart, that the river of living water flows from him to every area of your life? And that's a picture of us individually, but that's also a picture of us as the church corporately. We should be taking this river of living water to the streets, to our neighborhoods, to our schools, to our homes, to the people that are around us, to our family members, to our jobs. This river of living water should flow and touch every sphere of life. But guess what? It doesn't stop in Detroit. This is a river of life that brings healing for all nations. God's called us not just to reach Detroit, although he's called us to reach Detroit, but we can't stop in Detroit. God's called us to reach the world with the message of the gospel. He wants us to take the gospel to places that it's never been. There's still vast portions of this earth who have yet to hear about Jesus at all. And as a church, we're going to be a part of that solution. Yeah, we're going to send missionaries. We already support a missionary in the Middle East. Yeah, we're going to help church planning. We're just helping a guy who's planning a church in Australia. But I believe in the future. God may just have us plant another cross and anchor location somewhere else in the world. Now, I don't know about that. We barely have one right now. But I do believe that anything's possible with God. And that sign back there, wherever it's at, it says, for Jesus, for Detroit, for the world. Yeah, we're starting here, and we're not neglecting here. We're never going to lose sight of what God's called us to here. But we're at the same time simultaneously called to reach the ends of the earth. And maybe it's Canada, or maybe it's somewhere else. I think about this conference. People are literally going to be coming to this conference from all over the world. I believe that the day is coming. Even this year, there's going to be people coming from other nations. 
God's starting something. God's starting something in front of our eyes. I believe revival is coming. I believe that God's going to do something so incredible. And he's going to let us be a part of it. And it's not for our fame, but it's for his. God's going to spark something in our day and age. And we're going to see, I think, through this conference, because it's not just going to be our church. It's going to be the church of Detroit that's going to rise up and say, we're done with disunity. We're done with territorialism. We're done with having our own little part of the pie. And we realize that we're one, and that we're stronger together, and that the only way we're going to truly advance the kingdom of God is when we act like we're unified under the single name of Jesus Christ. Because what brings us together is greater than what can divide us. And I think something can start in Detroit, in Detroit, that impacts the world. Something, a river of life like Detroit River, it can flow through our city and it can impact every part of our city and every part of our metro area and it can expand not just to Michigan and not just to the Northwest and not just to the Midwest, but it can expand even across the world. Church, would you stand with me? And can we believe that God wants to do something incredible with us in our day and age, that he's not done with us, but he has a plan and a purpose for us and he wants to use us to reach this city and beyond. If you believe that, Let's sing about this together. Just receive his love in this moment. Let the rivers of living water just flow through you as you lift up your hands and you worship God. sense in the room when we when we hear about big vision and big things like this don't we don't we feel inadequate at times 
Don't we just feel like there's no way, like there's no way I could do that. There's no way I could see that. See, the answer though isn't in you being resourced more or you having more uh, things at your disposal. The answer is in you being filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Because guess what? You can never do the things that God's called you to do unless he's empowered you to do them. The only way you're going to achieve the plans God has for your life is with the empowerment and the filling of God's Holy Spirit. So yeah, maybe you feel weak. That's fine. God's strong. Maybe you feel inadequate. That's fine. God's got more than enough. So if you feel like that tonight, can we just raise our hands and say, God, Holy Spirit, burn. God, I give myself to you. Let's sing that. afresh even now, that our weakness is being filled by your strength. And if there's anyone here tonight, maybe you have yet to have the Holy Spirit come into your heart and bring those rivers of living water. Maybe you feel dry. Maybe you feel empty. Maybe you know that you're missing something. What you're missing is God. And he wired you, hardwired you to be connected to him, to have a relationship with him. And you're never going to be satisfied. You're never going to be fulfilled unless he comes into your life and changes you. So if that is where you're at tonight, I just want to pray for you. I want to lead you in a prayer to give your life to Jesus Christ. And it's not this prayer that saves you. It's faith in him. But all you're doing through saying this is you're just putting words to that faith in your heart. So if you want to give your life to Jesus tonight, I'm going to invite you to do that in just a second. God, we pray that you would move in this room, move in hearts, bring people to life in you. While we're praying, heads bowed, eyes closed, is there anyone who would just be able to say, that's me. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I need to give my life to Jesus. I need him to fill me up. I just want to invite you to do that right now. I'm going to count to three, and if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. One, God loves you, and he has a purpose and a plan for you. Two, he's in this room right now and he wants to move. Three, raise your hand. Say, I want to give my life to Jesus. Awesome. Who else? Who else would be bold enough to say, I want to give my heart to Jesus tonight? I can't see every person in this room, but God sees you. And I just want to, I just want to lead you in a prayer right now. You just say this to God. We're all going to say it out loud together because we're in this with you. Say, dear God, I give my life to you. I surrender to you. Would you fill me with your spirit? Jesus, I turn from my sin and I turn to you. Make me a new person. You're my Lord and you're my Savior. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Come on, how incredible is that? It's amazing. Congratulations. Congratulations to those who made that decision. I, I don't.